it was in about 1935 that uh, uh, the hood came off uh, the mouth of the River Tees and uh, the uh, Redcar fishermen were charging five bob a time to row people round the, round the ship. And I badly wanted to go around there, but my mother couldn't afford the uh, five bob. Well, th th this was what inspired me, that I, that I, want, I wanted to, jo to join the, the Navy. I'd never seen anything quite so powerful and beautiful. For what, beautiful for a battleship sounds an awful word, but it's, it, there was no other way to describe her. She was unique. There were, there were three battle cruisers built, Hood, Repulse and Renown. And of the three, Hood was the, uh, the mightiest. She had four 15-inch uh, turrets, and she was the better-looking of, of, all, of all three. So um, I think that was when I first got the idea that I wanted to, jo to join the Navy. And I, jo I was 15 on the 1st of March, 38, and I joined on the 7th of March. We went from Portsmouth to Gibraltar, joined her in Gibraltar, on one of the liners, I think it might have been the Mauritania, I'm not sure, and when we first saw Gibraltar and first saw the hood there, it was a massive ship, actually beautiful to look at, it was a wonderful looking ship, you know. beautiful ship. Mm. She was long and uh, perfectly symmetrical, two turrets forward, two masts, two funnels, two turrets aft. Marvellous looking ship. I think the majority of people who joined the Hood believed they were slightly above average because it was, it was the flagship of the fleet. Uh, you weren't quite good enough, say, to join the Royal Yacht, the Victorian Albert. You had to be a little bit better than average to join the hood. We had quite a good reception. Of course, I was still a boy then. I think the, uh, the reputation that she got of uh, being the most powerful warship afloat and the epitome of British sea power, and she's recognised throughout the world as the most powerful warship afloat. I think that had a lot. And her, the grace of her lines, etc also had a lot to do with it. When she was going at full speed, her uh, quarter deck w was virtually underwater, that the uh, wash uh, came up either side of the, of the quarter deck. You can see the power and the grace in her there. And, uh, she, Hood uh, and Bismarck uh, were pretty much of a muchness in, in as much that they were the pride of their own f fleets and they were handsome ships, there was no doubt about that. They had been a refit and had taken out the secondary armament of six inch guns, they were actually 5.5, and put on seven two and four inch anti-aircraft guns which were called L1, L2 L3, R1, R2, R3, left and right, and the seventh gun, uh, which the Marines manned. And I was on L1, which was the forward one on the port side. We were all right on the hood because, I mean, it was the best, it was the finest ship in the world, and we were safe. No bother. That was our personal feeling on board the ship. Did you think it was unsinkable? More or less, yes. More or less, uh, we could take on anything the Germans could send and uh, we'd come off best. There would be casualties, obviously, but uh, it wasn't going to be me, it was going to be someone else. Everybody thinks that. Similarly, if you walk across the road and somebody dies in a motor car accident, didn't you, it's someone else. <clears throat> as, far as, as far as we were concerned, the German fleet, uh, compared to ours at that time, was numerically very inferior and we believed and understood that uh, from a, a readiness point of view they were also inferior. 
we knew that um, the Tirpitz and Bismarck were under construction, and we knew that they had the two battle cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisnow, and the three pocket battleships Deutschland, Graf Spee, and Admiral Speer. What we didn't know was the size of the Bismarck and Tirpitz, which were, under the convention, only supposed to be 35,000 tons. Whereas, in actual fact, Bismarck turned out, uh, and uh, Tirpitz turned out to be 50,000 tons. goes to sea. A floating city of 1,200 men leaves harbour for adventure in great waters. Submarines too. Their destinies are always dangerous. The Navy has always been ready. So when war comes, the ships have mysteriously and quietly reached their war station. Few people have seen them go to sea on that first important muster. They have been moved according to prearranged plan across the chessboard of the world's surface. In unnamed havens round the British Isles, appear the watchdogs that keep tally on the North Sea bases of Germany's skulking battleships. So it has been in innumerable encounters up and down the oceans and along the vast inland sea. As it was in the days of Nelson, so it will always be when the Navy goes to sea. Well, the fleet were gathering, were being placed on a war footing anyway. And Hood had finished her refit in, in Portsmouth. And I joined her in the, in the June, just as she was completing the June 39 she was completing the refit and we sailed from Portsmouth for Scapa Flow where the home fleet was uh, mustering and from there at the beginning of September the home fleet sailed and we were actually at sea in the North Sea when the declaration of war was made I think the object was that uh, we were at, at sea so that in, in, the, in the event of any war being declared, we could make any surprise attack uh, that was necessary or repel any other attack. The home fleet was an exercise in the Heligoland Sea and we were at action stations on the morning of the 11, Sunday 11am when war was declared. And we were allowed to come up from action stations and gather around the various um, radio uh, tannoys on the ship because it was the actual declaration was uh, broadcast to everybody on the ship's company. We were the home fleet was I think about the only one prepared. We were in the Heligoland Sea so that. Uh, preventing any Germans coming out through the Skattegat and Skagerrak. What was your own reaction when you heard we were at war? I honestly don't know. I think we cheered, but at the same time, inwardly, there was a little bit of doubt. Bismarck. The 
Admiral, he expected the Bismarck to come through the Denmark Strait in the early dawn, and that the Prince of Wales and the Hood, with two or three cruisers, would bring them to battle. I went to Chequers on that Friday afternoon, May 23. Admiral Harriman and Generals Ismay and Palmel were to be with me until Monday. It was likely to be an anxious weekend. I had, of course, the most complete service of secretaries in the house and also direct telephone connections with the duty captain at the Admiralty and other key departments. We spent an anxious evening and did not go to bed until two or three o'clock. We heard that Bismarck had uh, completed her trials and had was come out of the, of the Baltic and was traced by the Norwegian underground and reported to be heading for a, a Norwegian port. The commander-in-chief decided that she was obviously going to try to break out into the Atlantic, where there were quite a large number of convoys shunting backwards and forwards at the time. And he decided the best thing to do was to split his, his, the home fleet up. And he, he and King George V stayed at Scapa Flow to cover the uh, area south of Iceland. And Hood, Prince of Wales, and six destroyers were detached to go to Halfjord in Iceland to cover the Denmark Strait and the area immediately south of Iceland, which was the most likely place for the uh, German ships to break out. Hood and Prince of Wales left Scapa Flow uh, to go to north to Iceland. There are three ways that the ship could get out. The Denmark Strait, in between Iceland and the Faroes, and the Faroes, Scotland. So we were going to uh, Keflavik in Iceland to wait reports which course she'd taken. We left Scapa at 1600 on the 21st of May and we went to, north to Keflavik to refuel and to wait uh, further details of where the Bism which route the Bismarck was taking. But as we arrived at Keflavik, we had been given the sighting reports of the Suffolk, Norfolk and Suffolk. We immediately, leaving two destroyers to refuel, we immediately turned north to intercept the Bismarck and Prince Eugen. Well, it was very, very tense. We'd had so many false alarms with the pursuit of Deutschland and Scharnhorst and Neisner, etc. We'd had so many false alarms that at first, when we were on the, on the way up to uh, Halfyard, when the captain broadcaster said to give the ship's company the gen of what was going on, we thought, ah, oh, well, just, just another false alarm type thing. And then we had I just about got to, we were just about to enter Harfield when the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk, who were patrolling up and down what we, what we called an A to K line, it was a line of cruisers which patrolled up and down the areas where the ships were likely to break out as a first, first stop. And uh, Suffolk sighted uh, Bismarck and this heavy cruiser and reported into Admiralty. We intercepted the, the uh, enemy reports coming in of the, of the radio and the Admiral ordered complete radio silence as far as we were concerned, apart from the interception. And we turned to, 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 do, to intercept the, t the, the two ships. At the course and speed that they were doing, it was estimated that we would be in a position to engage at two o'clock in the morning of the 24th of May. His Majesty's ship, the Prince of Wales. The cruiser 
Greater Suffolk and Norfolk. The light cruisers Manchester and Birmingham. His Majesty's ship, the Hood, our largest and our fastest ship. The commander-in-chief of the home fleet deploys his ships to guard the various passages into the Atlantic. The hunt for the Bismarck was on. All this time, you understand, two destroyers would rejoin us and then two more would go back to refuel. So we had four destroyers with us all the time. We should have met the Bismarck at midnight on the 23rd of May. But unfortunately, there was a blizzard blowing, so we couldn't sight anything. But our radar did pick up two ships going south on the expected course. So the Hood and Prince of Wales turned south and orders were to switch off the radar in case they could pick up our signals. I don't know how they do it, just in case. And the destroyers were sent ahead on the northerly bearing in open order, about half a mile each, so that if they were the wrong two ships they would pick up the right two ships and we would turn around. It was, became very obvious that action was going to be imminent and consequently we went to action stations at midnight. Meanwhile the destroyers were rapidly losing ground on us because the, the sea was pretty heavy and they couldn't maintain the speed that we were doing of 28 and a half knots. So the Admiral made a signal to him saying that regret if you cannot keep up this speed I will have to press on without you. Consequently by the time the action took place the destroyers were about 50 miles astern. We gained contact with Bismarck on our radar at about 3 o'clock on the morning of the 24th of May. And at that time she was about 30 miles on our starboard bow and she was doing 29 knots herself uh, steaming out towards the Atlantic. Admiral Holland decided he would maintain a parallel course to her until such times as the weather moderated and visibility improved. Also he knew what we didn't what we didn't appreciate and that was the fact that Hood being a battle cruiser they'd had to s sacrifice a lot of armour for speed so consequently her deck armour was thin and vulnerable. You see it was it was always intended that that uh, weakness should be, should be rectified but in peacetime she could never be spared she was always the flag, flag waving cruises and uh, showing the flag, uh, all that type of thing. And in wartime, she, uh, she could never be spared for the length of time it would have taken to have done the job. Admiral Holland, his object was to get in as close as he possibly could during the action so that the fall of shot w uh, would be a, a, a flat tra trajectory rather than a, a higher plummeting effort from a, a longer range. And whereas our maximum gun range was originally 20 miles, but reduced to 17 because of her age, the maximum effective gun range was about 12 miles. Admiral Holland wanted to get in to 8 to, to um, get a, a, a definite flatter tra uh, trajectory of it. And he turned towards the Bismarck at about 4 o'clock. It's a degree of being frightened. I was frightened, obviously, but anybody who's not scared is an idiot. But uh, we were going to win in the end, uh, so we were still confident. Although, as I say, well, everybody was reasonably scared. 
of the unexpected, I should think. I don't think anybody really thought that the hut would be sunk. Nobody on board gave it a thought. There was a certain amount of tension, yes. Uh, I wouldn't say we thought it was going to be historic, but we thought the hood was the best, and we would beat the enemy. But uh, as I said previously, there were going to be casualties. You don't go into any action like that without expecting casualties. But once again, it's going to happen to someone else. It's not going to happen to me. Um, everybody was prepared as much as you can prepare. There was fear, yes. Um, I, as far as I personally was concerned, I was frightened. But my main fear was fear of showing fear. It wasn't fear of death. It was fear of being maimed and not being able to do anything about it. But the main thing is, it was fear of showing fear. But it was mainly excitement. I, uh, I don't. It was ex, there was a mixture of excitement and uh, and uh, and tension and, and apprehension, but mainly excitement. It was something that we'd been waiting for. It's something that we'd been wait, wanting all all the way along. There wasn't a man aboard that ship that had had any doubts about her capabilities. She was the epitome of British sea power. She was the mightiest ship afloat and we were proud of it.